Sunday night across the West Midlands, and for a change, it's all happy bunnies across the board. We will talk more about it over the next 60 minutes or so. Welcome to the West Midlands Football Podcast on the Birmingham Live TV channel. We are streaming across Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and uh, normally, at least there's, there's one element when we do this kind of thing, who who has got a lot to kind of moan and complain about. But it was a very rare occasion that uh, over the weekend, with the notable exception of Warsaw, which we we may get to, um, everybody's a winner from the weekend. Victories for Villa uh, Wolves in the Premier League, in the Championship for Birmingham City and West Bromwich Albion. Both those victories are significant, which we will go into. And uh, also, we're going to dip into the National League as well, which we'll explain about more in just a moment. First of all, welcome along. I'm Ben Ellis. I'm joined, uh, as usual, by uh, Gavin Longthorne and also Dom Phillips. Guys, evening. Good evening, Ben. Good evening, Matt. Absolutely wonderful stuff. And we'll we'll go through it all in just a moment. Now, um, the, the thing about the National League, uh, one of the eye-catching results uh, from the weekend, Solihull Moors beating Dover Athletic by five goals to nil. The same player got all five goals, which is absolutely uh, astounding. And uh, we tried to get him on to the show. Uh, and I've been badgering him and badgering him and badgering him all day. Um, but I've had no response. <laughs> so I wanted to get the guy uh, who scored the five goals onto the show. Uh, it was to no avail, but uh, we do want to take the opportunity to say um, congratulations to Andrew Dallas for getting all five goals for uh, Soli Hallmore. So w- what I wanted to do in uh, the meantime is uh, set you guys to work uh, on uh, a time realistically supporting your own clubs. But if, if you can broaden it out to... Um, football in general, that, that would be fine uh, to get a better example. But by the time we're finished uh, in the next hour or so, to come up with an example or a story of a single performance uh, that will last long in the memory for you, which you look back on and said, oh, this guy was amazing that day, or it was an exceptional performance or something that could possibly go down in folklore. So if you could uh, both have a, a think about that. Uh, from uh, supporting uh, Dom's a Villa fan, Gav's uh, a Wolves fan. Um, we can broaden it to England as well if you want to, if, if, that, uh, if, if that kind of floats your boat uh, as well or any kind of international football. But uh, yeah, congratulations um, to Solo Hormores and to Andrew Dallas. All five goals in a 5-0 victory um, against Dover Athletic. Uh, we're going to start um, just for a change this week because the, the last couple of weeks we, we've started with Villa in the Premier League. But uh, Gav, we're going to start with Wolves. Uh, uh, this week because it's now uh, four wins on the bounce in all competitions. Mm. Uh, 3-1 victory at uh, Brentford on Saturday. Um, we're going to come to the, the ins and outs of it in just a moment. For, for those who don't know, who are, are tuning in, what, what what was the delay about? What, what was the game stopped? Uh, which time? <laughs> there seems to be about yeah. four or five throughout the game. Uh, initially, there was a, a stoppage for about five minutes where unfortunately... You had to see it after what happened with Jimenez. Um, two of the Brentford players uh, seemed to clash for each other. It was a midfielder, Jensen, and the uh, ex Walsall left back, Rico Henry, as well, seemed to um, clash with each other. And it was seemed like a very nasty one. Uh, Roll precautions were took, obviously. Both players substituted off. Uh, both were used for the concussion substitutions, which I'm all for. Uh, and then the most bizarre thing this is the thing that you love or hate about football. You, you're never surprised on things that happen, or you've, you you always see something at least once a season that you've never seen before. I've never uh, witnessed a game be stopped through um, a drone flying over the ground. It seems it's it seems to last forever. I mean, we, we have our own private uh, WhatsApp group where we not deliberate outside of the show, and even said to you both, I don't think I'm going to be able to make the show at this right. I think it's going to be a tough one. Um, yeah, it just seems to be a, a, a very, very um, bizarre game of football. It seems to be a very stop start. Um, eventually, at about half past four, we went to start the second half, and then the referee had a stoppage as well for some sort of technology malfunction. I don't know why that wasn't checked in the 15 minutes that they were off the pitch, but there you are. We'll get to the referee as well later in the, in the discussion of the Wolves game. Uh, but yeah, that was the the the, the reasoning for the four or five stoppages. I would say uh, 
it seemed to be make of it what you will, but I think there was a bit of turnabouts fair play from our from Wolves as well. Also, I think there was a bit of as we said last week, I don't think you need to do the team talk for that game. And I think that was what was put into it as well. Um, but as I said, that was the reason for the stoppages. And it seems to be a very cagey, uh, very stop-start game of football. I don't think the flow really went throughout the whole game because of those uh, incidents. Uh, for me personally, I think that we were the better team overall the whole game. Thomas Frank came out after the game and said that he felt that if one team was going to win the game, it was them. Um, I'm really not sure what kind of football he was watching, if I'm going to be completely honest. And I'm as down in the middle as, as a football fan, as you'll, you, you'll know. Um, I think we had that slow little bit of uh, class in the middle of the park, even though they packed it with three. I think we had that, that slightly better ilk a player in the middle of the park. And I think that that um, came through in the end of the game. Two very good goals from Matino and Neves. Uh, disappointing. I hate seeing players dri- get drifted off like that in the, in the box like Ivan Tony. I mean, it, it's very frustrating. Uh, I think it's down to zonal mark, and even now with Bruno Large, I think that's something that we we practice in games. Um, but overall, it was a very impressive performance. Not an easy place to go to. Not by no means. They're still looking over the shoulders. Um, he does try and keep them as organised as he can. Uh, Thomas Franken, not just from the previous game against us earlier in the season. I saw it in other games as well, where I think he plays that tactic of I'm trying to think of the right words, but Tom Weiss has last warned up merchants in the, on the field for them also. Uh, and I think it, overall, I think it was the fair result. I, I, I really do. I think we bossed the game in parts. And I think, uh, as I said earlier, we, we had the better quality of player. I think it showed with the result. I think it, it's the clinical side of Wolves again, which we've talked about mm. uh, sort of in, in previous weeks. You know, don't concede many, don't score many. Amongst amongst the lowest in terms of conceded in the league, but also lowest amongst of goals scored, although two games in a row, um, you know, five goals from the previous two games isn't 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 too shabby. But two shots mm. on target with the two goals uh, mm. on Saturday, you know, and that's, that. you know, you know, if you're having, I mean, we'll talk, we'll come to Villa a, a, a bit later in detail. Everton had like 13 attempts uh, mm. on goal against Villa, only one on target. So mm. it, it uh, and Villa kept a clean sheet. So it, it very much that, that clinical, sort of methodical, very well organized. Uh, mm. uh, and, and Dom, I, I think, you know, if he continues in this way, uh, sort of Bruno Large, I mean, he, he sorry, Gab, but he, he, he's going to get noticed, isn't he? Mm. Yeah, and I, I don't mean to say that with any disrespect to Wolves either, and I know that you don't mean that either. It's very you know, when when a club gets a good manager, you don't want to instantly start you know saying oh he'll you know p- nobody offers coming in. But I think he's been massively impressive. He was you know, well liked in Portugal. Obviously, it's well known Wolves like to look fair, and that's not a reductive statement. It's also true. And um, they've gone there, and they've got a really good manager from there in Large, who's I think as you say, they lack that clinicality. They lacked that sort of cut, cut, like cutting killer edge. In, in the final third. And I think a lot of that is often psychological. A lot of it is confident. I think it's similar with Brighton, a team who are often lauded of being the, you know, the XG merchants. They're getting lots of chances, but they're not converting them. And I think a lot of it is just psychological. Um, it's how confident do you feel? How natural do you feel? How comfortable do you feel? Because these are all top level players who can finish. And I think now that Wolves are building a bit of momentum and a bit of confidence, I think we could really see probably the best of Bruno Large's Wolves is yet to come probably the next couple of months. Mm. And I remember as a Villa fan at the end, at the end of um, sorry, at the end of kind of twenty twenty, so the start of the twenty 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 one season when we decimated Liverpool, destroyed Arsenal away, and we were at Christmas we were fourth, I believe, or just gone to fifth, but we had a game or two in hand. So we were in absolutely and utterly flying. I remember Everton were flying early in that season as well. And I think hopefully Wolves can get into that same position that we did. You know, they can get nice and high the same Villa aiming to this season, but hopefully they can stay there longer than we did. Because I think it's very diffi- It's difficult to get up there, but once you get there, you've got to stay there. And I think that could be a real test for Bruno Large's Wolves. I think it's a very, very fair point as well that Don's made. I mean, I think a lot of it is psychological. You look at that Wolves eleven that played yesterday and in the majority of games, uh, you take the goalkeeper out of the equation and one or two other players and it's basically the same eleven. Um, mm. I think it's that emphasis that, with the greatest respect, I think you saw it when uh, Nuno Santo went to Spurs. I think that was the reason why, for me personally, I couldn't see it lasting past Christmas. Uh, brilliant, brilliant manager for what he did there. But I think it was a time to maybe 
change the emphasis of how we play. I think he, he, the, um, largest, you see it a lot with the midfield as well, and I've noticed it where you've seen Neves and Matino flourish now with what he's telling them to do. He's pushing that five yards further forward. Uh, Neves is trying to move the ball a bit quicker and not set him on the ball in the middle of the park, and I think that's what you're going to see. Uh, that's how you're going to see the best come out of him in the next couple of seasons as well also. Um, and I, th- as you say, I think it's just the emphasis of, of the style of play as well. I think there's more... It's more put on actually trying to go to win games and try to score in games. Uh, still think we're missing, even though we played with three and they all played very well yesterday. Uh, we had that 10 minutes, especially in the second half, where you're crying out for that number 10 style midfielder that I think would have given you something a little bit extra that would have maybe unlocked the key, as we said a couple of weeks ago. I think that's something until we saw on somebody like that. Um, it's always going to be a topic of conversation. Um, from what I've read, it seems very strange also yesterday because when that goal got disallowed for him and it was a good finish, uh, he seemed to run over and celebrate with, with large afterwards. Troll raised, from what I've heard, deal to Spurs, seems to be nearly signed, sealed and delivered. So it seemed really strange it played yesterday. Celebration gives you a will he, won't he, but what, from what I've read, it seems like he's going to go. Uh, there's a couple of rumours flowing around where I think the money that they're going to get from Troll Ray, they're potentially going to be reinvested into Renato Sanchez from Lille, make that of what you will. Um, there's other clubs that are sniffing around him, like Milan and Barcelona. So those might have a bit more pull than us with the, the grouch aspect, because as you said earlier, Dom, uh, you're always going to be linked with players or managers doing very well at our place. Before we get to the level that we want to get to, uh, that's going to be an unfortunate circumstance that you are going to have these rumours and links coming out. But um, yeah, I, uh, I think going back to what you originally said, I think the style of playing, the emphasis is definitely, definitely different this season. Looking at the midfield, uh, Gab, particularly from uh, yesterday, I mean, it's been described in uh, the media and on social media as a, a 3-5-2 formation. So traditionally, when you're looking at a 3-5-2, you're looking at the full-backs or the wing-backs as they become in that formation pushing on. So um, you've got Nuri and you've got Semedo, uh, who would have been fulfilling that role sort of yesterday. I mean, you could put your hat on in, as a middle three, Neves, Matinho and Dendonka. Uh, in the middle of course um what what about those two wing backs how, how effective were they uh i think especially samado again yesterday um there's a question mark over his head for me when we first signed him and the, the pro stack obviously as well <coughs> pardon but i think he's really starting to flourish this season i think what you're noticing as well also which you saw it a lot in the man united game and you're seeing it in little bits in other games as well and you saw it especially yesterday as well uh they seem to be pushing more as a five rather than a, a, a five in midfield rather than a five at the back now. Mm-hmm. I think you're seeing a lot more attacking intent from both of them. Uh, I think eight Nori, I think that's when Marcel isn't playing, I think that's his, his strength anyway. I think you have to get him going up there and overlapping full backs on the opposition side as well. Uh, I think that's what you're seeing also, Ben. I think there's more of an attacking threat being given to the team from them being told to push up a bit more. And obviously, in games where you're playing uh, teams where it's going to be a bit difficult, you've always got the, that option of pushing back as a back five again and maybe having those giving some consolidation to the three centre-halves. Uh, I think that's the difference that you're seeing. I think there's more uh, intent on going forward at the, at the full-back position. And defensively, is it just so much better for Connor Cody to have somebody either side of him? Yeah, yeah. Um, Connor Cody, as a Wolves fan, absolutely love him to bits, but um, I still wouldn't be convinced about him in a back four. I think that back four overall where he's playing as a sweeper is, that's his bread and butter now. I don't think he, he I think that's where you're going to get the best out of him. Um, I think he brings the best out of the centre-halves playing either side of him either. I mean, it could have gone either way, bringing uh, Totti Gomez back in from, from his loan recall, and it could have gone either way. But I think having somebody like him at the back where he's very vocal, uh, I think he, he gives you a lot in the dressing room with his defenders as well, also, which is, I think that's why Southgate locks him a lot in the England squad. Um, I think that's the, 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 I think that's where you're going to see him flourish the most in the back four of Connor Coda. Um, wouldn't be convinced in the back four, but I think as a, a sweeper in a back five is, is one of the best that I've seen in the, in the Premiership since that system's become popular, really. So, as we mentioned, four wins. On the bench in all competitions, mm. absolutely flying, uh, starting to get noticed in terms of, of the results that they're getting. What now? Because it stops for a fortnight. 
That's it, isn't it? I mean, it's the whole thing in football. It's international break, a break. Uh, you'd love this to be another game at three o'clock because I did to get that momentum going. I think it's really just a case of the manager's got to keep earning his money and he's got to make sure that they take that momentum into the next game. It's the Norwich game on the 4th of February on the Saturday uh, in the FA Cup, the fourth round. So, yeah. Uh, why not go for a cup run this season? There's nothing stopping us playing that same team again and keeping the momentum going, as I said. And then obviously we've got, I originally thought it was the rearranged game, but it's actually at home against get started on the Thursday night afterwards in the league. So I always, I, 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 I can't bear <laughs> league games on a Thursday yeah. night. I, I really, I think you can see it in the footballers sometimes as well. I really, I, I don't think it's a good knob for football. No, it sounds a bit strange to some people, but... No, I, I do, completely agree with yeah. you. I completely agree with you. But, um, Dom, yeah. Just start on on this um, from a, a wider sort of perspective. Do you, do you think it's slightly odd that the Premier League have come out and said that in this what was going to be a scheduled break, they're not going to play any of the games that were called off previously for COVID? I think it's really strange. I mean, I can't remember exactly when this winter break was brought in, maybe one or two seasons ago. And I like the idea of there being... I like the idea of there having a players who have played a lot over the festive and New Year's period because I, I like the, that tradition, but I do also think that it's a little bit on top. You get too many injuries. I think Villa suffered that with you know, Tom Heaton, Wesley, Targ had a bit of an injury at that time. Trez got a bit of an injury at that time that season as well. So I, I think they need to address that problem. So I think there's a wider problem of fixture congestion around this time period. And I, I think that the winter break is to like let people have a bit of time off isn't the best way to do it. I really don't. I, I, I think it's better that they spread the fixtures out more generally. And then when you add into the mix of the point that you just made about all of the rearranged fixtures that need to be played, I think it's absolutely utter lunacy that with that on top, they're not even using this two week break as a time to go. Just let players have, even if it's one game or like instead of two, it just helps teams so much who are going to be having so many congested games in the next few weeks and the next mm. few months. I just think it's really stupid and it really helped teams out because I know that, you know, for Wolves, four wins in a row, they can't wait to get back out on the pitch. Mm. I don't think Villa can get, can, you know, wait to get back out on the pitch. So I think it's really, really annoying. Well, this is the thing, isn't it, as well, also? I mean, I don't know whether it's the case for Aston Villa, but we're having this two-week break and then including the cup game, we've got three games in a week. So you, you're yeah, back yeah. to the old the old reason of cool. why this was brought in. I, 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 the, well, at the same from time, what I was told, it was exceptional circumstances to try and play these games. So why can't they look into the possibility of just yeah. postponing it for this season and starting again next season? I just think, as Dom said, it's lunacy, really. But at the same time, you know, the, the, they talk about bringing this break in. Um, that, that was that happened either a season or two ago. COVID's been destructive with this kind of thing for the last mm. couple of years, of course. We had our traditional sort of Christmas and New Year. But earlier on in December, you had uh, full programmes in midweek mm -hmm. uh, in the Premier League. I, I don't see what the necessity... Well, Amazon Prime presumably wanted to get... That's where they wanted to do their thing. Where they didn't want to be doing it over a weekend, of course. But uh, obviously, t TV streaming, obviously, that, that takes a, a, a big portion of, of, of the cash. But I, I would, I'll, I'll find it interesting if we get to the end of the season and the Premier League haven't taken this opportunity to play some games that could have been played, that have been previously cancelled, that could have been played during this gap, and then you'll get to the end of the season where you'll, it's going to happen. Sean mm. Dyche is going to say, oh, we've got... we've got," Because I think Burnley have had more uh, postponements than anybody um, uh, during these uh, um, this Omicron variant. And... Uh, he'll, he'll be saying towards the end of the season, we can't get these games in. We're absolutely exhausted. And their final game of the season is against Newcastle. So I think it kind of sort of bear that in mind as, it, as it's coming. Also, and I'll get your thoughts on this before we move on to Villa. With, with this break that's coming up, uh, a lot of players are, are, are going abroad. Um, there's talk about, um, I think, John McGinn's going abroad um, for, for a little bit of a holiday, for example. Now, I, I don't know the, the vaccinations uh, status of individual players, but I, we do know there are reports that are a large number of um, professional footballers who are unvaccinated going down the sort of the Novak Djokovic route. It's a bit dangerous for them to be going abroad, isn't it? Because every, not every country is in uh, the shape COVID-wise that, that we are in this country. And I, I just think that that might be a bit of a risk. 
I think this is where the clubs are going to step in, Ben. Um, I really do. I, I mean, I know that you can't control what they do on the outside life and the social lives uh, when the Leicester squad got can, like, criminalised for going to the dark. So with that, I, I don't think there's much you can do with that. I mean, people have got to have a social life, but if you're going abroad to countries where, as you say, the vaccination laws are different, the infection rates are different, um, it's it's a it's a pot waiting to just boil over really. I mean, it's this as you say. You talk about Burnley. There's four games in hand that they've got now. Where they're going to fit those games in as it is. What's going to happen if there are more postponements? Uh, and then to put it all on top of it as well, we're having a an, a winter break and an extended winter break next season for the World Cup and the normal winter break. So this is where it's going to really be tested. Yeah. And that's the thing as well about this this break uh, that's coming up. It's not as if we're going straight into a, a a tournament in the summer once the 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 latter stages of the Champions League and the Europa League have, uh, are concluded, because we know we've got to wait till November before we get to the World Cup. <laughs> so, uh, so at the same time, it just uh, I don't know. But uh, there we are. You with the uh, West Midlands Football Podcast on the Birmingham Live from the Birmingham Live TV channel. We're streaming on Facebook, at YouTube, and Twitter. We do welcome your comments and your thoughts as well. I'm Ben Ellis, joined by Gavin Longthorne and Dom Phillips. We're looking back at uh, the weekend action, a very successful uh, weekend of action for all of our teams. Moving on to uh, Aston Villa and uh, Stephen Gerrard, obviously. Uh, feeling very satisfied with going to Goodison Park and coming away mm. with mm. Uh, three points. There's, there's a lot of plots and subplots uh, around this one, of course. But Emi Buendia getting the goal for uh, Aston Villa, a beautiful uh, flick header at the near post from uh, a corner right on half time. This led to some uh, unsavoury scenes in uh, the corner by the Gladys Street end at uh, Goodison Park, which we'll get on to. Um, Dom, what what I would like to think about this, and, and, and having watched the game yesterday, um, and think about Stephen Gerrard made a comment afterwards that th- this was the strongest performance uh, so far in his time. And I was trying to p- sort of piece those words together and think, well, what, what, what does he what does he mean by that? And 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 I realised that what he's saying is that what he didn't get from a winning position at Brentford, he got at yeah. Everton. Exactly, and I think I think the what, the separation that I would use, I'd say that's our strongest performance under Gerard. I wouldn't say it's our best. I think yeah. we were at our best second half against Man City. You know, at times against United in the FA Cup. I think, and, and in the Premier League, indeed, the second half against Man City is probably some of the best football I've ever seen Aston Villa play. And we won that half one nil. Um, and we should have won it three or four. We absolutely played them off the park. And the thing is against Everton is I don't think it was a glamorous game. It was a scrappy affair. It was a ground. There was you know, lots of thick, lots of missiles being thrown, some of them onto Aston Villa players, which was obviously disgusting, as you mentioned. There was a very intimidating atmosphere, which Stephen Gerrard decided to match by uh, glancing at their end and sticking his tongue out, which I enjoyed, and fist pumping in front of the tunnel on the way out. I think he loves it, Stephen Gerrard does. It was quite fun to see that. So, yeah, I think it was a really great affair. It's a really proper, grindy, strong, you know, everyone to a man worked really hard. I think Buendia has been getting applauded, so I think he deserves them. I think we all said at the start of the season, it's going to take him time to settle. Early on, he was getting a lot of criticism. He was in and out of the squad with a couple of injuries. You were like, you know, is he going to do what Bailey's done? Where obviously he's had a couple of injuries and he's sort of faded. But I think in the last, especially since Gerrard's took over, especially since Coutinho has arrived, actually, the last three or four performances from Emi Buendia have been sensational. He's completely ran every single game that he played. He sort of plays sort of off the right or off the left, but he just comes in front and lets people run on ahead, and he just dictates a game. He's a really hard-working, defensively and defensively player, and even though he's a little kid, little I think he's got that little Argentinian South American grit, and we saw that with his header. It was beautiful technique, but to get up for that header, to make the run, it was admirable. And I think he deserves the plaudits. I think Villa deserve the plaudits. It's a very hard fought one nil away win. Saturday lunchtime isn't a kickoff that anyone wants to play in, if you ask me. Mm. And I think it's really encouraging that Stephen Gerrard's been able to get and see a different side to his squad that I don't really think he's had a chance to see yet. Mm. We talked last week about the difficulty of playing um, Ollie Watkins and Danny Ings in uh, the same team. Stephen Gerrard made the decision to go with Ollie Watkins. Uh, but what we are seeing is that even though we've said that Watkins and Ings can't play in the same team, we've seen that Coutinho and Buendia can. And yeah. uh, and it's and it's kind of, kind of been very effective. Now, 
given you've got Coutinho and you've got Buendia and uh, they're, they're pulling um, opposition midfielders and defenders all over the place, then you definitely can't, ha- you can't do that and have both Ings and Watkins up front. Mm-hmm. So he went yeah. with Watkins. Uh, Watkins had license to go. As I say, it wasn't spectacular. It was, it was scrappy. And but but I thought I thought Villa were the better side in the first half. As you say, dug in uh, when they had to in the second half. But but it's really pleasing uh, to see how well um, uh, Coutinho uh, and Buendia seem to be functioning together. Uh, and uh, and I think you're right. The the you know Buendia could have could have gone on sulking saying well hang on i was bought in for 30 million quid i was supposed to be the guy who was replacing the superstar who's just left and now you're bringing in philip coutinho what where, where does that leave me not a bit of it first class exactly. attitude and, he, and he, he's, he's really knuckled down and uh, and, and fair play to him i couldn't agree with you more and i'll let you come in the gap it's a second sorry guy uh, <laughs> no, that's, okay. that's right i, just, I thought when dear i think he's as you say he's got first class attitude i mean i remember dean smith saying in the summer that we were going to sign him regardless of whether Grealish, you know came left stayed whatever he was a top target for us and i think they saw that he could work with Grealish, and they can see that he can work with coutinho as you say that on field chemistry is amazing terry's been uh, sorry not terry jesus uh uh gerard's been saying that how well they work together in training and they just look like two players who want to have fun and take players on and create chances. And I think Ollie Watkins didn't have his best game he's had up front, but he worked hard. And on another day from the goals will eventually come, especially when you've got those to either side of you. Yeah, he had that one moment, didn't he, in the first half? Um, Ollie Watkins, where the ball came, a beautiful uh, sort of first touch, and and Jordan yeah. Pickford was was kind of out at, at his feet. But mm. you, you know. It, you can kind of see where this is going with with Steven Gerrard and, and the, the kind of shape and direction he wants to take um, Villa in. And they're, they're, they seem to be the, the club that are associated with, with all kinds of players uh, during during this transfer window. I mean, Gao, I don't know what you've seen, that there's, there's talk of Luis Suarez. I know yeah. if, that's just, yeah. if that's just the Gerrard factor, I don't know. You know people putting two and two together, but, you know... It, a month ago, we'd have said Coutinho would come in. Well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, I think that's what we've said the past couple of weeks. I think that's what Gerard's going to give you now. You're going to get that Ilka player being linked with you because I think they're going to come and want to play for him. Uh, you take these rooms with a pinch of salt, but as you said, why not when you've got somebody like Coutinho in there? Uh, as you both said, I think you really, really noticed the past couple of games that I think Gundy is stepping his game up now. It might be because Coutinho's come in and he thinks he's come here for more number 10 shot and I really have to show the manager what I've got, which isn't a bad thing. And then you've got the uh, other thing thrown into the mix as well, where you've seen Jacob Ramsey really come to the fore. I think he's starting to look like a very, very promising midfielder for you now. I mean, it's um, it's exciting times, really, because, I mean, you've got the makings of a really, really promising midfield going forward. Um, I think, for me personally, I think he went with Watkins over Ings, because I think... Ings is more of that number nine, from, from what I know anyway, even though he's a good footballer, I think he's more of that number nine style player, but I think Watkins has that uh, tendency where he can hold the ball up a bit more and he can bring players into the game, because I think you've got goals in midfield now, and that's always a dangerous yeah. weapon to have when you've got a player like that playing there. Um, it's nice to see, it's nice to hmm. see, sorry Gary, it's nice to see no, Dom, isn't it, a, 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 a player pick up the ball and, and a, a and he did it more than once yesterday, sort of a driving run with midfield with with uh, opposition players trying to chase him and bouncing yeah. off him. And, you know, you, you go back you go back to sort of like Patrick Vieira and you get to, back to Roy Keane and uh, and sort of players of, uh, of that ilk in, in the Premier League. I mean, he, he's only a young lad, but, but, but that was very, very eye-catching, that performance yesterday from Jacob Ramsey. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, to be fair, I don't think it was ramsey's best game that he's had under gerard i don't think he suited the scrappiness of the game i think he's looked better i think he looked better against man united when we were on top and he was just carry i, I agree though he just carries the ball so brilliantly his little flicks and little touches but also i think he's got a lot of the a lot of size to his game that you don't really see in usual premier league talents from a lad who's just turned 20 and i think that could probably be down to his relative experience I mean, he's got. He went on loan to Doncaster, obviously, for a few months, and did well there before COVID sort of scuppered that. And he, 
just been just been brilliant for us, especially this season and especially since Gerard's come in. I think he's a really, really mm-hmm. exciting talent. He reminds me of someone like Frank Lampard, who is really good on the ball, but just arrives in the box. And again, he's only just turned 20, so I don't, you don't want to put too much expectations and too large comparisons, especially when someone's manager is obviously Gerard. But I think he's got all the makings to be that that top quality midfield. He's got such grit, such work rate, right? such an engine really good tackling like he's only 20 but he's just as i say he's got so many things that i don't see from other young players i think it's as well like i, I would personally like seeing a, a, a midfielder do that though i like them seeing bringing the yeah. ball forward in the middle of the park uh the other things you can add on with experience and game time i think with uh him being able to do that i think you'll in the future especially when he's working on someone like gerard i think you've got that uh perfect manager there that can teach him how to read the game properly as well um yeah, I don't, I don't think you've got a very promising player on your hands. There. It's it's uh, oh, it's the one of those clubs, the Villa, where I think they've got a, the, similar to Southampton and other clubs in the Premier League. They seem to have a very very good academy. You don't see very mm. many uh, poor players coming out of the academy, and it's it's for me personally as well. When you see players like Patino coming in, uh, Buendia coming in for a high fee, um, I, I always like to see those academy class burst, uh, players burst through as well. I, I, I think it's good for the game. And also, Dom, if you're going to have that that player that that drives forward um, from midfield, where it's, it's not always going to work, and he's up against top class sort of midfielders and defenders, and he, he might occasionally lose the ball, so you, you've got to have that sort of sound defensive sitting holding midfielder. So if you're looking at the moment, like um, Douglas Louise, uh, marvelous Nakamba, uh, when he comes back, but in the remainder of the window, the, the week or so. Uh, that that we've got left. Do, do, do you think Gerard he, he, is out to strengthen that defensive midfielder position? Yeah, I think you picked the perfect time to talk about it because obviously today John Percy and Tom Colomos, who are the two most reliable Villa journalists, have sort of broke the news that Villa basically have bid twenty five million for Ibrahim Basuma from Brighton, which is I think we could all agree is a bid lower than the player's value in terms of how good he is. Um, he's been that's been rejected. And we are currently in talks for Juventus's Rodrigo Bentancur, who is a recommendation from Luis Suarez, who um, he's been at Juventus for a few years now, but he's still only 24. Um, he sort of burst onto the scene and then he sort of faded back a little bit, but he's got a lot of qualities. He's six foot two, can sort of play a little bit further forward in the number eight as well as the number six, if you want to talk in those terms. But he's got really brilliant stats. Um, he's come with, with mixed reviews from Juventus fans you know, don't like him, but I'd like to remind everyone that Juventus fans wanted Pearl as manager when he was didn't do well there. They didn't want Chiesa at their club when he's now one of the best players. Um, they hated Ronaldo for a time there, even though he was scoring goals for fun there and winning them trophies. So it, it's it's difficult to take those fan reviews in account. I know he's played tonight. Um, he started for them tonight, which is interesting. So I definitely want to try and catch a look at that game to have a look at how he's played. But it seems like talks are going to be continuing next week for Ben Tanker, but you know, he's got that height profile, that physicality profile. He's got a lot of trophies on his CV. He's a good age at only 24. He ticks a lot of boxes. He can pass the ball, but he can also break up play. And I think that's what we want. So I'm really hopeful that we could get a deal for him over the line. Cause as you, as you agree, I think that's probably along with center back in terms of cover, especially, I think that's the biggest position in our team that needs addressing. Yeah. Um, the, the big news as well, that uh, Emmy Martinez signing, uh, well, a yeah. contract mm. extension as well, which was uh, very, very good. Uh, good news for Villa. We talked about the break previously with Wolves and, and the effect it could have on on their momentum. I was listening, Dom, to Steven Gerrard, and he's really excited about this break because he, he will get the opportunity, depending on how many stay or go. Um, he said they'll give him a bit of a break for a while, but um, he's going to get a sustained period of time to to get to know the players that he has because it's been a it has been a kind of a whirlwind for him since since yeah. coming in, uh, and you know he can get the transfer business um, done and dusted once the windows close, and then he can he can really sort of um, stamp his authority in the, on the squad and get to know his players. Yeah, I think that's massive for him. I think the most crucial thing is that Jared hasn't had a pre-season at Villa. Um, he came in in the middle of the season when a club had just lost five like five games in a row. He's tried to he's changed the formation, change the style of play, change the personnel. Obviously, Axel Twanzebe leaving to go to Napoli uh, when he'd been playing the last few games under Dean Smith. So he's, he's he's made an impact on the squad. Obviously, he's already got in uh, Philippe Coutinho and Luca Dean 
Um, so now I, I remember him saying they're going to the Villa coaching staff, that is, that he's brought with him all of his people from Rangers, as well as mm. Austin McPhee and Neil Cutler, who are already here. He's going to um, treat it as a mini pre-season, so to speak. They're going to be working massively on fitness. I think that's going to be huge for the likes of Felipe Coutinho. Hopefully Leon Bailey will be back after this break as well. I'm hopeful that we want to see whether we'll get the best out of him on one of those flanks in terms of the two number 10s or maybe even up front. He might be a real handful, I, I think, uh, in this Gerrard system. And yeah, he's going to get a chance to work on fitness. As you say, get to know his players on a personal as well as a professional level. And I just think it's a really good opportunity for him. He said they're going to like reset the identity, reset the style of play. And I just think tactically we're going to be playing more, even more. I mean, we're playing more like a Gerrard team now. We're going to be playing more like a Gerrard team. Everyone's going to be clear on their roles. Everyone's going to be fit, firing and ready to work at the rate Gerrard wants them to work at and be in a top physical condition. So I think as much as I want the momentum to keep going, especially going into some fixtures that I would claim are quite favourable for us, I think it's a good chance for Gerrard to make this more like a, a Stephen Gerrard Aston Villa, so to speak. You tune in to the West Midlands Football Podcast from the Birmingham TV channel. We're on Facebook, YouTube and uh, Twitter. We welcome your views as well. Here for another uh, 20 to 25 uh, minutes. Uh, hi to Matt, who has messaged us. We're getting back to the conversation on Wolves. Uh, Martinho has showed his class. Uh, if Wolves had a top mm -hmm. striker... They will be challenging for a top six finish. Uh, we have moved on from Wolves. I'm going to come to you on, the, on the, that point, Gab, because mm. I've only just seen um, uh, the message. If Wolves had a top striker, uh, I mean, do, do you not consider um, uh, Jimenez as that now, given the, mm. the injury that he had? Uh, I, I do, personally. I think it's not... <laughs> He hasn't been as clinical in front of goal since he's come back, but I still think he has that class holding the ball up, as we said, with somebody like Ali Watkins for Villa. I think that Jimenez does that for us. I think he um, he gives you that little bit in the final third so we could hold the ball up, bring other players into the game. Uh, when he does get chances, he, he can be clinical still. Um, Fabio Silva, it's a 50-50 split between Wolves fans at the moment, what they think of him as a backup striker. I'm... Um, I personally wouldn't say no to bring in a more established striker in. Um, it's obviously not probably going to be from the Premier League. Uh, you're probably going to be going down the foreign route, but uh, for a backup striker or competition, I wouldn't say no to bringing him in and maybe uh, loaning Fabio Silva out to a team where he's going to be starting every week. He, he started yesterday, uh, but that was because I think him and has picked up a slow calf knock. Um, so that ruled him out of the game. But I, 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 even though he had those good couple of games where he came on the, the last league game, uh, played very well against Sheffield United. I still think he's missing that uh, more established bit of class, really, uh, as a backup striker. Um, I think you saw the goal from the goal side being weighed in. I think he got that a lot with Hangi Chan before he got injured. Uh, him coming back next month is going to be like a new signing for us again. Um, but I don't disagree with that in terms of competition. I think um, it's hard to push him and us out of that number nine position at the moment, playing up front on his own. I think that's when he's fit. I think that's his that's his spot. Um, but in terms of competition, I want Sino to bring in another uh, top class striker in, if you will. I think we're having problems picking you up, Ben. Yeah. Yeah, my bad. Uh, everybody's on mute at, at some points. Uh, my mistake. Um, thanks for for that, Gav. So um, just a reminder of how we're finishing the program today. We set our panel to work uh, to try and come up with um, a, a performance from a, a player uh, of a team they support or in broader terms as well that was absolutely sensational that will sort of live long in the memory um, that that kind of thing it's in relation to uh, Solihull Moors who uh, beat Dover by five goals to one in the National League yesterday all five goals from the same player Andrew Dallas uh, which is a, a phenomenal uh, achievement it, it doesn't matter what level of football uh, it is that but if we can uh, come up with those memories in the next 15 minutes or so that would be absolutely brilliant we welcome your views uh, on that as well moving into the championship and uh, we're, we're going to go with Birmingham City now because um, quite a lot happened uh, this week after uh, cajoling uh, really from uh, certain sections of uh, the fans a representative of uh, the club's owners actually came forward and uh, gave an interview to uh, a, a local radio station with the acknowledgement 
uh, that they need better communication uh, in terms of how they they um, they come across to supporters. But the owners, uh, they're stressing, Dom, have no intention of selling Birmingham City Football Club. Now, this led to, well, it's probably always going to happen anyway, um, a, a protest, a march from uh, Digbeth up to uh, the ground at St Andrews, about a, about a mile walk, I would suggest. Um, I, I've done it a couple of times. Uh, it wouldn't have been a, a very pleasant walk in amongst all those roadworks for the trams and stuff like that, but um, the, they managed to um, get to the ground and, and, and make their, their voices heard. But, you know, we've all been uh, in, involved uh, with our clubs when we've been dissatisfied and we want to have... Uh, have our say and have a have a bit of a protest. I remember it against the likes of, of Doug Ellis and Randy Lerner. I'm sure there's been Moxie and Morgan things, Gav, mm. um, that, mm. uh, down, down the years before uh, our respected current owners have been uh, have been in place. So, um, th th do you think this will make a difference, Dom, or, or do you think the owners just paid lip service to Blues and just to try and keep them quiet for a bit? I think it's precisely that. I think it's very very disingenuous from the Birmingham City owners. I mean, we we've all I'm. Mean, I know that Wolves have had many owners in their time, and obviously, had, but like, well, I think we've all had owners where they say, "Oh, we're going to do this. We need to do this," but they never actually do it. It's a completely empty phrase. They're just trying to just placate the fans temporarily, and you know, hope that Lee Bowyer gets more wins like he just has, and then the fans might lay off the owners, and then things will go that. We've seen that with Man United and the Glazers. Let's be honest, haven't we? Um, every, every few wins, they just sort of go, oh, Glazers out, Glazers out. Then a few wins later, they don't want to know, they don't really care. So I think that's what they're trying. Um, in terms of what the owners should be doing is, it, it's, it's, I, it, I don't want to retreat too much into too many cliches, but it has to be said, football clubs are, you know, the fans, the fans run the financial side of it. Without fans, everything crumbles. It's like the bottom of a pyramid. And um, also, or maybe a deck of cards, yeah. And yeah. Uh, You've got to pan. You've got to listen to the fans. If the fans say it's time to go, then it is time to go, and it's not just time to go. As in a, a small minority of the fans, it's a massive protest, a mile long walk, huge demonstrations. The Birmingham City board transfer wise are just loading players from Man United. They're not putting any, you know, real injections of quality in terms of permanence into the squad. Financially, they're sucking money out of the club. Um, parasitic, parasitic is the word I'd probably use, and. I think we can all agree that the Birmingham City owners are, I'd say, reprehensible and that everything that they're doing right now is just talking out of their backside, to be blunt. <laughs> Edward Jeng is the director who gave uh, the interview, speaking to the BBC. Uh, this was ahead of uh, the supporters' uh, protest. Uh, uh, Apologise for Blues Board, previous lack of communication. Uh, this is a quote. Communication is the key. I noticed something happened on the social networks. In Chinese culture, we're always willing to do first, then we talk. Now, I'm not... I mean, he's entitled to say that from a cultural um, point of view. Uh, and I don't want to come across as saying, uh, well, that's a load of rubbish, uh, mm. quite frankly, because that, that might be um, might be a, a key component of Chinese culture. The The evidence that I would have... Uh, dumb to counteract that is that before um, Villa's current owners, there was a Chinese guy in charge who said lots and did very little. So yeah. it, it was, it's the opposite, isn't it? So yeah, yeah he was he, he he was all mouth and no trousers. So th this lot of saying, "Oh, we do, we do, we do, we do, we do," then we say, "Well, you've had nothing to say, so you've obviously done nothing." And I think that's what the, that's the point yeah. the, the, the Blues are, blue fans are saying. And, and it's no worth saying that you're going to do things and then say, there's no point doing that. Oh, we do things and then we say, well, there's not just the things that you're doing are wrong. Like you're not doing good things or that's, that's the whole criticism is that we do. And then we say, it's not just communication. I'm sure, I'm not sure what Blues fans are looking for from the, you know, the Birmingham, the people in charge of Birmingham City are, hello, here is the bad thing that we did. These, these are the warped reasons why we did it. And this is the bad impact it's going to have on you. That's not what they want. What they want is they're, they're, they're club to be doing good things and making good decisions, making good signings, good business choices, and they're not doing any of those things. So I, I, I just think it's a very, very weird thing to say. And as you say, you don't take away people's right to say it and you respect what people say. But again, I, I think it's disingenuous. I really do. Well, this is it for me as well. I mean, 
clubs, if Blues got relegated and the owners were doing their own due diligence and they were doing the rock for the club, the fans would take it. The thing yeah. that really annoys me, and you, you've quoted the interview as well, Ben, there was another quote in that interview, and it stuck in my throat a bit, where this, the, the representative said, it's not in our thinking to talk to the fans. I'm sorry, mm. but you might own the club financially, and you might own the club in writing, but it belongs to the community and the fans. I grew up in Birmingham my whole, my whole life before moving to Tamworth, even though I'm a Wolves fan, and it's an integral part of the community. And I think also the FA and the EFL have really got to start stepping up and doing the proper due diligence on checking these business people that are buying these clubs. I mean, it's going on 40 miles up the road from St Andrews now where it's 50-50 on a pendulum where the Derby are going to exist this time next month. And it's it's how many times are we going to see this happen? Or how many times are we going to see this happen now? I understand that the fans want them out and it's going to be a hard it's going to be hard to try and find somebody to buy them but as i said earlier look how many owners of blues going to have where this is going to happen now well it's this is the second or third time in a row where they've allowed somebody to come in and buy the club and they're leeching the funds and they're sucking the club dry and they're not putting the right amount of funds back into the club and i think this is really where it's it's happened to Berry. It's happened to Wimbledon. I know it was a while ago, but not too long ago as well. Before a lot of this due diligence was brought in, looking at these owners of potentially buying clubs. But I think it really has to be stepped up now. And it's you could get into the crunch time where I know we're going off topic a bit, but you're seeing things happen like the potential introduction of the European Super League in the next ten years, and this is going to have a more of an impact on these types of clubs as well. And it's really got to be looked at more. And, and I suppose thinking sort of uh, long term, if, if the, the Super League does happen and mm. there are uh, people, particularly in Spain and Italy, who are still adamant that it's going to happen, that it'll be great for football, then in terms of marketing a, a, a product of football, you know, the, the FA, the EFL, even the Premier League, they're, they're going to look at, you know, Birmingham City are going to become sort of big, the big fish, really. They're going to be the, the kind of clubs that, that, um, that, that they're going to want to uh, become attractive to um, mm. people watching all, all over the world. That certainly wouldn't be the case uh, today, which is unfortunate. But on the pitch, uh, a 2-1 victory against Barnsley. Peterborough uh, to come in midweek. Peterborough at the Hawthorns. Uh, sort of yesterday, so this is the, this is the key time for for Blues to, uh, as we say, rack up the points, ease the pressure a bit mm. on uh, Lee Bowyer, yeah, and then, uh, as I say, we're a bit cynical, but the owners think that the, the, the criticism will 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 quiet them down coming their way. But so um, we'll, we'll probably take that with a pinch of salt. Mm. Moving down the road to the Hawthorns, then we just mentioned that uh, that P- uh, Peterborough were in town. Um, West Bromwich Albion winning by three goals to nil. Now this, this is, is interesting. This. And I'll get your thoughts on this. I watched this morning uh, a highlights package of, of the game. And you would think watching the two minutes uh, that I saw with the chances that West Brom uh, created and, and the quality of goals that they scored through um, Dean Garner and um, the guy, Carlin Grant, who, who scored a very good goal uh, as well. I think, you know, they, they really turned on the style here, took those goals sort of really well but for for 80 minutes Dom uh, the Albion fans were singing what a load of rubbish yeah I, I think that sort of summarises um, Ismail's uh, sort of career at West Brom I think I, I think I talked about it last week saying that I think he had the perfect setup around him at Barnsley and everything worked brilliantly but I don't think they've got that those top class players now and even tactically I've seen a lot of West Brom fans from what I I'm sort of aware of, not that I haven't watched that much of them this season, but from what I've seen and from what I've read, the, the persistence with the five at the back is really, really frustrating. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the Wolves example for this, actually. I think it's quite pertinent. I remember watching Wolves play. I think, it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it was like Chester. It was some non-league team in a cup mm. with Nuno, and you had oh, five well, at the back. Like, yeah, yeah surely that was yeah. it. And it was a flat back five. The wing backs were just playing right with the centre backs. And, mm. you know, I think now under large, as you talked about with Ait Nuri and Samedo, how much they bomb forward now. It's the same with Ismail, the, the, the wing backs or, or full backs, because they're playing like full backs, aren't really doing much. And there's no support for the centre forward. And it's just a lot of the similar problems I think you had towards the end of Nuno's tenure at Wolves. Mm. And, 
a lot, I think impatience with the manager is wearing very, very thin at West Brom. And it's a shame to see because obviously they had high hopes of Ismail. He did a very good job, a very effective and efficient job at Barnsley. And statistics show that his style of football, you know, suits the championship and gets points. But I just think they're lacking, in, you know, a bit of confidence and freedom and a little bit of just initiative and encouragement and desire, to, which is what I think you need to go and attack teams. Because I do think West Brom on the whole have a good enough squad to go and attack teams and go and do well in the championship. And it's a, it's a real shame for West Brom fans that they're just sort of, for large periods of games, even when before they score a couple against Peterborough, they're just really tepid. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the the formation from yesterday and obviously there's loads of different apps where you can go to look and see what the formation was and mm-hmm. and, 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 and unless you're there, you kind of don't know for sure. But but, but the one I'm looking at is saying that you've got a, they went with three at the back, um, uh, Kipper, who's got, who got the first goal, scrambled one uh, over the line with about 10 minutes ago, Carl Bartley and Matthew, Matthew Clark. Then you got four in the midfield, uh, Furlong and Townsend out wide with Livermore and Reach in the middle. Then you got uh, Phillips and Grant just off of uh, Daryl DK. Now, Daryl DK, um, make, making his uh, home debut, went off injured and had to go off uh, for a scam. We don't know any more on that. So uh, that could scupper Valerian Ishmael's plans going forward if that turns out to be a, a serious injury. And he had a lot of chances in the first half, mm. did uh, DK. But I'm thinking about it from a, from a fan's point of view. If that is the formation, and, and I'm going to the Hawthorns, and we're playing Peterborough United at home, I don't want to see two holding midfielders. Mm. I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, I mean, it's it's as as Dom said, there's nothing wrong with playing a back three slash back four if you've, you've got the right players to do it and the right manager's yeah. mentality to mm-hmm. play it. If you're playing it as a flat back five and you're supposed to be one of the top six gunning for promotion, that's too mm-hmm. negative. I'm sorry. Um, I've, I've, as we said earlier with the Wolves game, football's a game that throws up things he's never seen before. I've never saw a game of football where a team had 26 shots on goal and those fans are saying that they were the worst team. Um, it's incredible to me, really. Um, yeah, it's Even though that's happened, it's absolutely crazy. They're still within touching distance somehow of the one make promotion places. Um, I don't know whether it's because the league's becoming poorer or it's because the, they're getting these results and they're picking them up under the radar. Um, it's just, it's cut and paste every game for me. I, I really think it is. I mean, as you said, Ben, you, you see the championship highlights in brief on a, on the channel of a Sunday morning. I can't remember the name of the channel off the top of my head. But you watch it and it was like they absolutely bossed that game, which they did not. They, they really did not. I mean, it was, it's very pedestrian. But he, as you said, if you're going up there, and I've been there myself personally, and it's been, not been when we're in a promotion chase, but you can only imagine what the West Brom fans are feeling and walk into the ground at 4 to 3 every Saturday thinking, oh God, we've got to watch this again. It's, it's, it doesn't make pleasant feeling. It really doesn't. And slightly concerning as well, Dom, that Valerian Ismail after the game was, was dismissive of uh, the, the Albion fans' uh, thought, thoughts on the game. He, he came out and he said, uh, I heard him on the radio say, well, we were... Uh, ahead in every stat uh, concerning the game. This was our plan. This is what we're doing. We won the game. I don't have to. I don't have to justify. It. Well, I'm paraphrasing there, but I, I don't have to justify um, uh, to people what we do. We're trying to get promoted. We get promoted, and, and we're ahead in the stats. And, we, and what, what's everybody's problem? I don't think it's as easy as that, is it? I think I know that it's a bit of an unrealistic game, and I think I've sort of mentioned it in terms of the quality of the championship going down. I definitely agree in the wake of COVID. I think financially clubs aren't probably getting as many deals done as they wanted to. And that's why you see Fulham now, who have always been a decent championship team, but they're what they've scored 19 goals in the last three games um, before the Stoke game, where they got a really good hard four away victory against the quality Stoke side with a couple of good young loanees in there. And it's I just see the quality of the league gone down. So to see, I, I think Ismail's West Brom is sort of getting away with that because I know that he's saying, oh, you know, the argument is, well, we're winning and promotion's the aim. But that was like with Steve Bruce at Villa when we got to the playoff final. We were playing awfully. I, I, mm. I do think we played awfully for a lot of that season, mm. the year we'd went up. It would have gone up. That would have been a disaster because it would have had Tony Zhao in charge, who obviously we've talked about him briefly on this podcast, and Steve Bruce's manager. And I think that would have been an absolute disaster for Aston Villa Football Club because I don't think either of them were competent. And 
you've got to play the right way. You've got to play in a way that entertains the fans. If you are in a grand lot of halls, which is what, 20, 30,000 in there, and they aren't happy, then you're doing something wrong as a manager because that's your first and most basic job. Because even, as, as Gav said with, with Blues, if you go down but you play well and you try and you work hard for clubs who, are, who, who have struggled or clubs who aren't always used to being at the top, like yeah, your cities and your Liverpools, that's all right for them. They just want to see a team that you know, makes them happy, wins some games and works hard. And they, they need to play with a bit of control. They need to think about their fans more because I, 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 I think those comments are quite surprising to me, actually. Well, he can come out and say that also as well, Ishmael. But, OK, fair enough. You can do that and you get promoted. But then what? You, you're not yeah. going to have that X factor to keep them in the Premiership if you're playing like that. That's just not going to work, I'm afraid. The, we say the quality of the Championship seems to be going less and less every season. But that gap is being bridged more and more and getting higher now for the Premiership. And you need that X factor and thinking outside the box tactics to really win games and keep yourself in that league. And if you keep doing a chumba wumba, as in go down and get back up again, go down and get back up again, when you go back up again, unless you radically change something, you're not going to be uh, like a Leeds who takes the, the, the lead by storm. You know, this, this lot have been up before. We know what this lot are about. And uh, and no, nobody's going to nobody's gonna fear playing West Brom. I think that's the problem Norwich have had uh, so far this season. Although... Um, just from a local point of view, it's nice to see them get back to back wins and Dean Smith get them out of the relegation zone, but that's that, that's by the by. Um, should just say as well that uh, the, the victory um, by three goals in, uh, against Peterborough dedicated um, to the memory of Jeff Astle. 20 years on from his passing, Jeff Astle's family were in attendance at the Hawthorns and, and uh, that they marked the occasion. And uh, you know every, every club has its has its legend, has its hero. Mm. Um, you, you often wonder, you know, like the greatest players to ever play for your clubs. You know, what would they fetch in today's transfer market? You know, Gav, what what would Steve Ball fetch today? You know, how, what, mm. what, if, if somebody come in saying we want to buy Paul McGrath, how much? How much? You know, it's, it's just kind of like an astronomical figure. So, mm. um, so for Jeff Astle to be remembered was a good thing. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. And uh, at the start of uh, proceedings, we said in uh, relation to Surly Hall Moors, who um, go in uh, with a 5 0 victory over Dover, the same player scoring all of the goals, Andrew Dallas. So, congratulations to him. We've been asking our panel to have a bit of a think through the previous hour of uh, a performance from a player that really sticks in the mind where uh, they were just sensational and could do no wrong. Uh, sort of on the day, maybe took all, all the headlines. Uh, I've got one in mind for my team, so I'll come to Dom in just a moment. Uh, but, but Gav, does, does anything come to mind for you? Oh, I'm going to go slightly retro with mine. Um, from my youth, back in 2003, um, when we got promoted to beat Sheffield United that day, 3-0, uh, at the Millennium Stadium, uh, Matt Murray and goal was absolutely sensational. Uh, as I said, I've watched it back and forth many times since then as well. Uh, and I don't think he, he, he laid a glove wrong that day. He saved a penalty to stop them coming back into the game as well. Uh, and I think it showed that it was a real shame that he, he picked up those many injuries that ended his career early. I think he would have been a contender for the number one spot for England. And I really, really, really do. And uh, that's one that I always look back on and think that that's a, that was a key Wolves performance in history. Mm. Very good pundit as well, I think, Matt Moriarty. Yeah. I do like listening mm. to um, uh, what he has to say from the, from the goalkeepers' union. Uh, so that wasn't expecting that, guess. So, yep, thanks uh, very much indeed. Uh, Dom, please don't come up with the one I'm about to say. Yeah, I, th I think we might actually have a similar one here because I'm going with the Villa promotion season. There's a couple. That I oh, no, 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 that's good. It's not then. Good. Oh, brilliant. Fine. Um, I'm going with John McGinn away at Rotherham, where um, I can't remember who it was. It was Tyrone Mings got sent off away at Rotherham. Um, this was one of the like I think we'd won a couple of games in the in the winning run, the famous ten game club record winning run, but um, we had ten men and for that second half when he went with a four three two and put Jonathan Codger up front with Tam, Tam, Tammy Abraham, um, he was absolutely utterly everywhere. It was like we had twelve men on the pitch, let alone ten. Uh, he completely ran the midfield and let Grealish and Abraham and Codger do their thing, and obviously we won the game. The away end was in absolute raptures and obviously went on to get promoted that season. John McGinn was unbelievable that whole season, but that performance against Rotherham, he was everywhere. That was the game where I think, looking back on it, where we really started to believe. We, we had Greeley yeah. out for sort of three months. He came back, was sensational in the comeback game against Derby. Then there was the game at Blues with the fan and, and getting the winning goal. 
uh, and but you know they were they're almost kind of isolated incidents but but away at Rotherham not long after yeah. that and you think oh okay mm-hmm. they went on to win 10 in a row if all of those uh, magic um, in the air that day I yeah. thought uh, yeah I, I I agree now I'm going a bit further back I'm, I'm going back more than 20 years uh to uh, a, a performance uh at Villa Park which I, I don't think I've seen uh since and it was from one Benito Carbone uh oh. against Leeds United in the FA Cup um, a, a classic cup tie. Uh, Leeds led twice in the game, and it, it, Leeds were, were really chasing the dream under David O'Leary back then as well. So they were they were a, they were a top team. It was it was the tie of the round really in, in the fifth round of the FA Cup, and uh, Carbone was just absolutely out of this world that day with a hat trick. Uh, the, the, the second goal, I mean, he, he's about forty yards out, and he, he catches that sort of Nigel Martin off his line. Uh, and, um, and and scores an absolute worldie, and then he gets on the end of a, he- a header from a, a Paul Merson cross. Who, who uh, Merson um, got head butted as he got the ball into the, or, or he nodded the ball across, and um, his face was covered in blood. But ben Carboni got the goal. I think we, we went on to the cup final uh, that year, the final uh, final under the old twin towers, and that didn't end the way we wanted it to. But um, never forget Benito Carboni's performance that day. It was sensational. Hmm. So, yeah, and on that note, uh, as I say, uh, congratulations to uh, Andrew Dallas and Solihull Moors getting all five goals against uh, Dover Athletic. And, uh, yeah, all well and good. Not really sure what we're going to be doing next week because um, uh, there's, there's a bit of championship, I think, uh, in, in, in the offing and stuff like that we might be able to react to. But as far as the Premier League is concerned, um, it is taking that break that we talked about previously. The Box to Box podcast on Tuesday night, so looking at things from a national perspective, the team will be there as well, uh, streaming on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. But to, for now, for me, Ben Ellis, Gavin Longthorne, and uh, Don Phillips, we, we hope you've enjoyed your football this weekend and uh, have uh, a good, safe, and healthy week. And we will talk to you again soon. Bye bye.